Uh, thank you for coming. And this year we are again talking about our plugin for IntelliJ. We are working together with Sergey in a company called JetBrains. It's a company which produces some tooling for developers, different kind of tooling for, first of all, it was an IDEs, after it's uh, some continuous integration solutions and so on. Uh, what is IntelliJ? IntelliJ is uh, our uh, biggest uh, integrated de development environment for developers. And it's a uh, multi-platform, multi-language, and nowadays it supports the language as well. So several years ago, maybe it's almost three years ago, I started my hobby project in my spare time. Uh, you can check out in it on GitHub page because it's free and open source. And Sergey joined me two years ago, as I can remember. And he continued his um, uh, he continued his work about preprocessor support and so on. So I just remark about uh, most of Erlang users are preferred to use some pretty simple text editor, yeah, for instance, Emacs as well, because they are very fast and very convenient. And if you are working, if you are using Emacs for maybe have been using Emacs for 20 years, it's um, more convenient for you because it's uh, your home and your uh, standalone and your favorite program on your computer and you are preferred to using it. Uh, but I believe it's uh, more convenient for not, uh, for more, more convenient to modify your program, to navigate your program when your, your code editor understand and fully understand your code. You can, um, migrate your code, you can re rewrite it completely, and so on. So IntelliJ itself is a good text editor, first of all. We have uh, the same um, basic thing like a hippie completion, which uh, is a called, it's a funny name, but uh, it's a completion through the old symbols and your old open files and your old buffers. So it also produces very famous and very wonderful thing. It's a true static analysis because your if you would like to support a custom language, you need to create some a full IST for every file, and after uh, IntelliJ can understand what's going on, and you can complete precisely, you can navigate precisely, and so on. Also, we have some built-in stuff like version control integration and web stack support, and so on. So, continue my talk about why IntelliJ, I like to share a very, very funny quote of uh, Colin Fleming, who is a Clojure developer, and actually he is developer of Clojure Curs Cursive Clojure, it's a plugin for IntelliJ to Clojure support, and he told that previous year that's a lack of typing, it's a feature, not a bug, and you need to try to modify, to modify your program not with a typing and not your but with some more convenient and more powerful code models. So I'm going to switch my talk to Sergey. So right, uh, now I'm going to show you some demos so uh, that you can have a general idea on what editing experience in IntelliJ uh, looks like. Well, first of all, you start with importing a project from somewhere. Uh, in this example, we have the project imported from Rebar, and it's, it just takes a couple of clicks to import a project. Uh, and right out of the box, you have uh, your project set up with all dependencies set correctly. Like, uh, we have this uh, OTP application eRedis pool, which is dependent on eDown, eRedis, and a pool boy. Uh, so, uh, another cool thing you get right out of the box is integration with uh, your version control system. So uh, you get to work with all your repository history and uh, you can rebase, merge, and do all the stuff uh, you're used to, but in a more convenient way. Uh, well, uh, let's, ju uh, let's just uh, jump right in and see what editing experience looks like. Uh, first of all, when you uh, are working with IntelliJ, it's all about typing less. So 
Uh, the IDE can do a lot for you. So for example, you might be used to using uh, file templates. We have this fun functionality in, and you can use existing file templates or uh, add your own or... Uh, so let's just uh, use this empty module template and uh, start uh, typing something. So let's just write this function demo and uh, the next thing we want to do is say call uh, create pool function from this eRedis pool module. Uh, it's just enough to write epcp, for example, so that we get all the completion here and uh, we can just pick the function and it's already there. The next thing you want to do is to know what the parameters are. So uh, there is this pop-up that helps uh, identify what the parameters should be. So let's just fill them in. Uh, and see what other editing options we have here. So you can, for example, extract variables, uh, like this is a pool name, and we can also have pool size here as well. And let's say you don't want these variables here, you want them extracted in uh, other function instead of being written here. So you, you can just invoke this extract function and have it extracted uh, below. So you now have another function. Uh, well, uh, when we have uh, some named things here, like uh, this is a function which is named parameters, we can navigate to its definition and we can, we can also uh, do a reverse operation of finding uh, its usages. So it uh, now has only one usage, and uh, there's not much to say about it. Uh, another cool thing about these uh, references and declarations is that you can uh, rename it uh, right in place, uh, and uh, it works across all the projects, so you can uh, find all usages uh, in your project and rename them. And this kind of logic applies to all the named entities there are. So it works equally well for variables, function names, module names, and it also works for atoms. So uh, it, it is kind of painful to rename atoms because uh, you don't actually know where the usages are. So uh, in IntelliJ, you can just uh, rename an atom uh, and explore uh, what changes are going to, uh, to occur. So as you can see, we have uh, another usage here in uh, test files, and it actually uh, is not something that we wanted to re uh, rename. So we can filter it out and only apply the um, refactoring to the parts that we want to. So uh, it just goes on correctly. All right, so uh, another cool thing about uh, the uh, ID experience is that you get static analysis running uh, while you're typing. So in this example, we have this demo function, which is apparently unused, as it is not exported and uh, it is not used from other functions. So uh, we get to uh, fix this problem by, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, applying these uh, fixes that are there. So we can export the function, and it's uh, automatically exported. We can also, oh, it's not my laptop, and I don't, do not use Macs. <laughs> so uh, we have some problems here. Or we can uh, do some uh, other stuff, like generating a specification for a function. And uh, this kind of support works uh, for uh, in a lot of different places, and uh, it has uh, various uh, other types that we have here, so we can generate the function back, and uh, there are a lot more applications. Can you bring the function to a different module? Well, yeah, we actually, do we have it implemented? Yeah, uh, I guess we have, and uh, I don't really remember. Does it work? No, it's yet to be implemented. <laughs> Well. Is it Wrangler? Oh, yeah. yeah sure. Is it Wrangler? Is it Wrangler? So, uh, <coughs> no, no, no. 
what happens quite, quite often is that you may want to convert your module into, uh, say, a Gen server. In this case, you can write a behavior and uh, you instantly have this uh, notification that you have unimplemented callbacks. So you can also go and uh, hit this implement all callbacks. You instantly have all the, fun uh, all the functions exported and uh, uh, their implementation stubs are also here. So it's kind of fun. All right, so uh, there is a lot more to show. So uh, we can navigate through uh, usages and uh, we don't need the behavior here. So for example, we want to go to where this create fun function, uh, create pool function is uh, implemented. So uh, let's, say, uh, let's say that we do not know what uh, this module is about and there is uh, this uh, module structure pop up. Ah, I can't really get it to resize. Oh, sorry for that. <laughs> Oh, I hate using not my laptops. Well, ah, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did it. <laughs> so you get to see uh, all the structure uh, in the file you have here. And moreover, you can uh, invoke the quick document. What's, oh, it's, it's the wrong hotkey, right? Can you open it up for me? <laughs> sure, it's wrong. <laughs> So uh, uh, from that pop-up, you can uh, look the documentation of functions. You can also uh, look their definitions, and you can uh, navigate to the symbols. And demonstrate by this, it is a very customizable e map, and um, you have inside the image, you like VIN, there is like ESM plugins, so you can have VIN, key binding, Uh, I think I should play. I'd probably be off. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have this plugin that sh uh, that showed the hotkeys I was pressing, and apparently we have some conflicts <laughs> in showing the pop-ups. All right. So uh, from this pop-up, you can uh, invoke, what was the hotkey again? You can uh, show documentation and definition. Also, you can navigate to this function. Huh? It's Control-J? Oh, all right. So I'm not used to using Mac. So <laughs> You have the documentation, but it's not well supported in uh, presentation mode. All right, so let's move back to, the, to our uh, original module we were in. Uh, it was EF Earl, right. So uh, another cool thing about uh, the ID experience is that you can uh, run any function and you can debug any function that, uh, that there is. So let's just try to run it. Oh, it's run. I wanted to debug it. All right. So here we have um, <coughs> debugging support. You can step through the functions and uh, explore what's going on uh, in the stack and uh, explore all the terms and bindings you have here. Like, uh, which may be, uh, which sometimes may be very convenient. Like, say, you're getting familiar with some new library and you want to know uh, what terms are uh, accepted as arguments. Uh, so uh, this is pretty much all I wanted to show you as of uh, ID experience was. Oh, uh, another thing about the debugger. Uh, the debugger can connect to remote nodes as well as running uh, some local stuff. So. Uh, it might be more useful than it seems at the first sight. So uh, you, might want, you might be wondering uh, what's under the hood of all of this experience. So this is what Sergey is going to continue about. Thank 
here and I'm going. Uh, I'm going to talk about internal infrastructure of IntelliJ and maybe after my oh, 10 minutes of explanation it can be more convenient to understand how it's work and what's going on when you are clicking to something and going to some another file and so on. Uh, so first of all we have a really bulletproof parser and it's generated from our, our home, home backed uh, parser generator called grammar kit. So we have a grammar or BNF notation and it allows us to gener generate a very uh, good parser because it's worked with incomplete code. We can't use the standard parser from our compiler as well because compiler says you you have an error in line 10 and after it, it stops because oh, you need to fix the first error and after it, something may change. But uh, you can't use this, the same approach in the ID because you need to type in and all the time your code is not correct because you just oh, refactor something or implement something, it's not completely correct. So also it generates not only parser, but uh, some IST structures and accessors to code model. And also we can match the, the whole file text to the BNF and understand what should be placed in this error place. And also it provides us uh, completion, keyword completion for free and error reporting as well. So we can easily say that, uh, so we code something and but we expect another one. And so it's almost the same as a keyword completion. Uh, very important thing in IntelliJ, it's references. It's uh, something, but uh, it's a resolution, simple resolution algorithm and some wrapper above it uh, and every symbol in IntelliJ can can have a reference. So after it you ask in a reference, please resolve me. So it's a kind of slang, our slang, but you need to ask the reference, uh, can resolve it to something and maybe it's some multiple results, I don't know exactly. And idea tells it, okay, this symbol is off to this definition or maybe to this definition or so it's very important that it's a cross language references because you can uh, have a reference from HTML to JavaScript and from JavaScript to CSS and vice versa. So the opposite operation, it's uh, find usages. Uh, you can ask an every, sim an every definition, please give me all usages of this definition across the all open projects. And it works really fast because it uses inverted index of symbols and asks the all symbols to resolve and checks if it resolved to the target or not. So after it, you filter out and that's all. It's worked in parallel and use your all cores in your laptop. So when you're asking to find, for instance, a very short name and very frequent name, for instance, ID, which is can be used in a global sp space, not that it's, it's uh, inside the function because inside the function there are not a lot of identifiers, but across the project there are maybe a zillion of them and it will be very warm in your room because your <laughs> laptop is working. Uh, another wonderful thing, it is an indexing framework and you can easily create your kind of, oh, different kind of index it's a, base, it's a file based key value storage and you can easily customize them uh, creating your own indexes and after it you can also create very fast code completion because you can ask okay index framework give me all functions from this file or maybe all functions by this name and so on. And very, very important, it's always up to date because when you are typing, the code changed, but the indexing framework uh, rest can your all changed files. And as for me, as a user of this framework, uh, all indexes are always up to date. So it's uh, no need to check if this is definition uh, alive or not. So it's always valid. Uh, another part, for instance, when you are working with open files, you can precise Oh, the maximum information of it and the, the biggest IST tree, uh, if you can imagine. But when you are working, oh, 
when, when you would like to complete another function from another model, for instance, no need to create the full tree of this file. So we can pre-index all the files in your project and can easily and very fast get you the smaller tree without, for instance, implementation parts, only stops, only um, declaration, and it's very fast and very easy. So it looks like, for instance, tiles for Google Maps. And when you are zooming fast, first of all, you have some tiles which are not pretty good, but it's OK. Uh, so about refactorings, uh, for some predefined refactorings, you need to extend some basic stuff, basic handlers. Uh, but it's some kind of work, because you need to implement the logic of the language and understand how it, what's going on when you'd like to refactor. You need to um, uh, re-import something or maybe remove some unused declarations and so on. But their name uh, is almost free, because when you're implementing, find usages and uh, your references. So it's very easy to understand what's going on, and you need to change all your references to this definition when you are trying to rename it. So, some also basic stuff, uh, you need to lint your code and understand what's going on, maybe something wrong or maybe not. And it's very great and very uh, useful framework about inspections and you can divide your inspection by priority and the top priority inspections go in first of all and low priority after it. So we have, for instance, uh, external tools inspection, so for, for dializer as well. And it has the lowest priority because it needs to run external tool, it's, it's a cross-process communication and so on. It may be not so fast as you like to be. Uh, yes, it's a basic thing for quick fixes because when you detect some code is not complete or it's wrong, you can create some uh, some action for fix this part of code. For instance, we have about maybe several dozens of completion of several dozens of quick fixes. Intentions is almost the same as infection, uh, quick fixes as well, but it's uh, some small refactoring, maybe not only for bad code, but uh, green as well. You need to, for instance, you need to translate uh, one kind of, for instance, uh, I don't know, it's some kind of transformations, really. And I'd like to ask Sergey to talk about Preprocessing because uh, his it's his field, and it's very hard part in the language or language support because they have uh, markers, and it's very scary. For instance, uh, not for understanding, but the idea understanding. And Sergey will talk about it. Um, uh, so. As Sergey has already told, uh, all the smart stuff we can do uh, in the ID is based on internal representation of the program. So when you have the preprocessor uh, building uh, this uh, representation uh, might be hard. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, what I've been working at, and uh, it is preprocessing support in the IntelliJ plugin for Erlang. And these are some examples I've stumbled upon uh, several open source projects. So this one, for example, was extracted from the Nitrogen web framework. And as you can see here, we have this uh, element-based macro, uh, which defines uh, some common attributes for HTML elements. Uh, and this macro is used in uh, various record declarations for uh, HTML elements. So uh, what we have here is uh, record fields which are defined through uh, macro substitution uh, are not marked as unresolved as we, uh, through macro expansion, we already know that these uh, record fields are actually there. So uh, another thing that we have uh, working correctly is uh, completion. And you see that we have all the completion variants that are applicable in this place. Uh, through macro expansion, and uh, it is kind of cool. So uh, let's move on to the uh, 
next example uh, I saw. So some people uh, use this pattern. So they use uh, a handler macro to uh, handle unmatched uh, of function calls. So uh, what would happen in uh, the version of the plugin uh, without macro support is the parser would expect uh, the next function close in this place. But what it has instead is a, a macro call, which in turn expands to the actual function close. And a cool thing about it is that you uh, get all the uh, experience from working with ID. Say, if you uh, were to have uh, something like this, uh, which is apparently not correct uh, function close, you get this notification that there is a head mismatch. So uh, all the stuff uh, just works there. So let's move on to another example. And uh, having the preprocessor working, you can <laughs> write something that crazy. And uh, the fun part, part about it is that uh, IDE uh, the IDE still gets what's written here. So it now knows that there is a function, and it uh, says that there is an unused function here named foo. So uh, what you can do with it is you can remove the function entirely, or you can uh, also export this function, and it works. You can even uh, do something like this, so you remove the argument, and it says that there is uh, an IR format call, which uh, uh, does not have correct arguments. So uh, this is kind of neat. So, all right, so let's move to rename what? Well, uh, this is the thing that we have still to work on, and uh, currently it would not rename uh, the macro because there is no sensible way to do that. that. And uh, I guess we should provide some uh, notifications that uh, the rename is potentially dangerous, and you can uh, and you should go to the macro definitions and see what's going on there yours, yourself. Yeah. You would see that you've got the atom foo in that definition of the macro foo. Yeah, and it is, it is possible. I mean, it is possible to find that out. Yeah. And it might be dangerous, yeah. Is, it, is there currently uh, something new that wasn't published yet? So uh, yes, it is not published yet. And uh, as it is open source, you can just check out the corresponding branch from the repository. Or if you don't want to, uh, to do that, you can uh, ask me to share a build with you if you're interested. I ask because I know that finding usages when there are macros involved sometimes has problems. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it, it is going to work and uh, it is going to find the usages. But it's not quite completed yet. So uh, as to not crazy usages of macros, uh, this example uses uh, this NFV9 header format to define uh, the header format of uh, NetFlow V9. And it defines various uh, variables which uh, are used then. And as you see, we do not mark these variables as unresolved because uh, apparently they have binding uh, up there. And we actually navigate to the uh, macro call which introduces these bindings. So uh, another example I wanted to show you is uh, the one you can find in RAC. Uh, they use uh, short macros there to uh, replace long record names. Uh, and uh, the macro itself expands to a hash and uh, record name. So the IDE knows that. Uh, what we have here is a record expression. So it provides correct auto completion here as well. Uh, the talk about macros and preprocessing support would not be complete if we didn't, call, uh, didn't talk about uh, different configurations of the compiler. So uh, if you have different uh, compiler options, you get different programs and you have uh, different code emitted here. So uh, we can switch 
uh, different compile contexts and have the resolution changed appropriately. So in this uh, default configuration here, we have uh, the profile macro defined. We can add other definitions as well, and the uh, IDE's interpretation of uh, your project changes when uh, you switch to other configurations. So uh, preprocessing support is not quite complete, but uh, I'm working on it. And uh, if you're interested, you can always ask me to try it out. So this concludes our talk, and uh, you're welcome to ask any questions if you have. Well, come on well, in. Is, <laughs> I think this is a lovely piece of work. I mean, the, the one thing that you didn't tell us was what language is it written in? It's written in Java. It's written in Java. Yeah. So we've got some stuff which is kind of complementary. I mean, you picked some of the things you've done. Um, well, you, you duplicate some of the things you've done. But we've got some stuff that's complementary for, for doing uh, language factorings. And we'd like to integrate that in IntelliJ. But that's written in Erlang. OK. Uh, so I, I'm working on in part of the Elixir and for the testing. I want to test that my code in AST that grammar kit generates is the same as Elixir does natively. So you can use JRFS, which is in the Erlang standard build, mm -hmm. to so IntelliJ is Java. So you so call on using JRFS. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, so uh, I uh, that the LGB Erlang classes for JRFS are annoying to use. It's not as nice as writing native Erlang, but it is a way to bridge. Right. <laughs> And we also have the debugger implemented. It uses uh, a couple of modules written in Erlang so, so that we have a seamless communication between Erlang and Java there. Uh, we could just rewrite files underneath you, but I guess if we did that, that would be... Uh, actually, it would catch up, and uh, it would still work if you change the files underneath it. It uses a file launcher. Yeah. System. Okay, so we could... Uh, yes. I'd really like to talk to you about this, because I think it's, you know, it'd be nice you right, you're welcome to come and talk afterwards. Yeah, okay. I'll do that. Thank All right, Joey. So I have a load of questions, actually. Um, I, I don't use IntelliJ. So is that a program I have to buy, and then this is a plugin I... Uh, IntelliJ like is free, and it's open source. You can... Oh, uh, and it's it, it also has this ultimate edition that is uh, paid for, and uh, it has a lot more to offer, like integration with other languages, databases, and but stuff. Yes, you can start with a free version and, and, and actually... To, I, I would like to track, I mean, I, I have some indexing stuff that I've written myself and I've put in 45,000 you know, like modules. So will it, does it scale nicely? Um, well, yeah, it does. Okay, good. As long as you have an unreinstated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and then the other thing, I was just wondering about documentation. I, I like beautiful documentation and is, is there a kind of way of writing beautiful documentation well, uh, you mean uh, just showing the documentation or no, editing, it. writing it? Like Markdown and things like that that, that are integrated with... with well, uh, I'm not sure that there is something. No. Uh, there's a Markdown plugin. Oh, th so there is a plugin, right? Yeah. But I like it sort of tightly integrated with the code. So, so if, you, if you write like the, the Erlang doc, yeah. they would automatically integrate into the control to Yeah. And also, as and also, as for the standard standard library, you get the documentation uh, downloaded from the internet, uh, like exactly at the moments you hit Control J, and it goes to the internet. <laughs> yeah, you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> I was a Java uh, developer for many years, and when I switched to Erlang, I was very happy. Like, I heard the words VI and Emacs, <laughs> and I was just, I said, no way IntelliJ can do it. And when I just saw the out of the box plugin, I was somewhere between grateful and helpful. Um, and it's, it's working great. I'm glad to tell you that people coming from Java are, can just see.
seamlessly yes. swim there. And I encourage everyone not using it to use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That's, <laughs> not, that's a nice word to hear. <laughs> we have, you know, IDE is like this. It's, it's like a cult because when you get into whatever you use, you don't get out. <laughs> Yeah, we actually use GitHub for that, so you can go to GitHub and report any issues you have there, or feature requests, or whatever. And today, Synthema is part of the JetBrains as a company, or is it still a standalone open source thing? It is a standalone open source thing. Are you, I didn't just get, are you JetBrains employees? Are you? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Cool. Brilliant. Right, any more questions? Well. Are you guys, are you guys working? Uh, for what doing with the max mode? For for nicely formatting a specific file you're looking at in the max mode. Well, uh, as we have ev everything working uh, semantically, so it, it is kind of different from what Emacs mode formats the files. But we have this hotkey which can run uh, Emacs uh, in the background, use it to format, and then uh, it gets back to IntelliJ. So uh, if you are working in a team that uses Emacs, you can just uh, use this hotkey. Right? I, I suppose, is there any way of integrating this with social networking? Because I'd always thought, if I, if I was editing a program. Ask the NSA. Sorry? Ask the NSA. Ask the NSA, yeah, right. right. <laughs> no, but I think if I, if I was editing a module and it called sort of modules X, Y, and Z, somebody else in the world might be writing a program that's calling modules X, Y, and Z at the same time. <laughs> and so I have a little pain there. So, so that would be a person to chat to because. So you're working on writing stuff in this module? Well, yes, and then the NSA would pop up and say, we know. I just wondered if you could kind of integrate the two. You want to discover some. You see, I always thought the problem with software was that somebody else had already written this stuff, but you can't discover that fact. So it would be nice to discover that the people had already written stuff you can't write. Well, if you want to find out if someone has written the bug release, that's when you use Shodan, which is for searching for open ports and exploitable code, also GitHub code search and Google code search is a really easy way to see if people have committed like the same password and the same bug. Um, I, I work at what was that called the first one? Shodan? Sh uh, no, Shodan. Yeah, S H O D A N. It, it, right. it, it's a search engine where you can search scans of the internet for open ports, and for, so it's a way to find uh, a lot of bugged servers at the same time. Sure. All right, any more questions? Well, thank you then.